Well, the 11th stop, uh, recounting uh, the journey uh, towards sustainability, um, deals with our understanding of wealth. Uh, now, many people have very different notions of what the good life is. But I think there is one idea we all would share. That is, a good life has got to offer some wealth in time. Now it happens, if you look at the evolution of affluent societies, that yes, these societies have brought about ever more wealth in goods, but at the same time have decreased wealth in time. In other words, we have become rich in objects, but poor in time. One of the reasons why it is very unlikely that um, the good life increases and enhances uh, um, parallel with the increase of goods. Now we can look at that a little bit more specifically. The reason for that is, you see, all goods are thieves of time. You have to go out, you have to select them, you have to find them. You've got to buy them, you've got to take them home, you've got to put them there, you've got to use them, you've got to repair them, you've got to dust them, you've got to store them away, and so on and so forth. And all the goods, all the objects, in some other ways also, you know, appointments of all kinds, are a claim on your time. But your time, in its conservative manner, is always only 24 hours. So there's the catch-22, if you want. We have got 24 hours as our personal time, and as affluence increases, more and more things, more and more appointments are being crammed in these 24 hours. The result is obvious, scarcity of time, nervousness. Nobody has ever got any time. That you can also, again, try to understand in a slightly different way. Um, and uh, the point I try to get at is that having too many goods even undercuts well-being. Ask a consumer psychologist. A consumer psychologist will say, well, a good you buy has a external and an internal satisfaction. The external satisfaction, or better maybe, the material satisfaction is, let's say you uh, go out and you buy your stuff for dinner. Now you cook dinner, you know, and you get filled up, that is material satisfaction. Now, if you go out and if you like to cook an Italian dinner and you like to invite friends, um, that again is immaterial satisfaction. So the cooking and you know buying things has a material aspect and immaterial aspect. Now it happens, of course, that to reap immaterial satisfaction costs time. The more goods you have, the less you're able to cultivate them, to use them, to uh, uh, um, uh, pull quality out of them, because you're lacking time. And so it happens that we buy CDs, which we never listen to, or we buy uh, hiking boots, which sit there in the cellar room, but are never used for hiking, because to use them to cultivate them, to reap the benefit, costs time. So inner satisfaction, the immaterial satisfaction, requires time. The consequence is that if you want really to um, optimize your consumption, beyond a certain threshold, you are well advised to limit your material satisfaction in order to leave time to immaterial satisfaction. 
And we come back, of course, to the old wisdom in a way that frugality, the careful use of material things, is an ingredient of the good life. And given that that truism, that truth, is still again valid today in African society, gives hope. Because it gives hope that a change or maybe even a slight reduction in material wealth will not be that important for our good 